Hi, thank you so much for having me. I hope you all are enjoying yourselves here um, at AHS this year. Um, so we have a lot of great microbiome talks, and I'm so happy I can talk about some of the tools that I use um, to heal the gut. I'll be sharing my protocols um, in a microbiome live training. Okay. Yeah, it's on. Maybe the battery's out. So it's coming up in Oakland, December 3rd and 4th. If you're a practitioner, coach, physician, chiropractor, um, any anyone uh, who's interested in the microbiome, um, we'll be doing uh, live training for two days. I'm teaching with two functional medicine uh, pharmacists like myself, Ann Nguyen, Dr. Ann Nguyen, who's BCACP certified, and Dr. Erica, um, uh, uh, Dr. Erica Gray, and she's going to be uh, la launching a new MTHFR engine, which is just amazing. Um, and she's doing nutrigenomic training. So I hope you can join us there. So we've entered in probably the sixth extinction here on Earth. Um, a really wise um, person named Abdel Omran wrote about the stages that we go through during uh, epidemiological population changes. He had first talked about famine and infectious diseases as the first wave, um, and we went through those pandemics. We traded one kind of infectious disease, typhoid, cholera, plague, malaria. These, all, these are all the pestilence kind of diseases, and I'm grateful we don't have smallpox anymore. Um, look how defiguring it is. Um, and we have you know, wonderful ways uh, to c combat that with modern technology. But now we've entered into a fifth stage where some of uh, the there's a resurgence of different infectious diseases, and he predicted that we would have man-made diseases like radiation injury, mental illness, drug dependency, traffic accidents, occupational hazards. What he didn't talk about, actually, is this new epidemic of asthma, atopy, uh, allergies, horrific food allergies <coughs> to common foods, dysbiosis, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, IBD, uh, inflammatory bowel uh, disease, cancers, just epidemic cancers. The WHO estimates one out of two is gonna develop a lifetime, has a lifetime risk of cancer, heart disease and strokes. So he predicted that there's gonna be resurgence of different ID causes, infectious disease causes. Um, and we've seen that. Um, I see commonly on gut testing all kinds of parasites, Giardia, Blastocystis, Toxoplasmosis, and when we quell these, we get reversal of health. We get, get we health recovery. People feel better. Their brain feels better. Their body feels better. I, I work with um, endurance athletes, executives, and multitasking moms. We rebuild the biome based on the ancestral templates that I'm going to go over today, and they feel awesome after we start working on the gut. And what we see now is even worse versions of the old infectious disease agents. We see multi-drug resistant tuber tuberculosis, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, vancomycin resistant enterococcus. Any of these, if you go into the hospital with it, you're, you're almost like half dead. The mortality rate is so high, the morbidity rate is so high. Now we have Clostridium difficile. When I first started in microbiome medicine a couple years ago, only 14,000 people uh, lethally had problems that died from C. difficile, which is caused by too much antibiotics. Now it's up to 29%, 29,000, and it's uh, only cured by fecal mi microbiota transplants. Have you heard of that? So to my colleagues and I in the medicine field, poo is more effective than pills, <laughs> pharmaceutical pills. And what I see commonly in my practice is dysbiosis on every level. Someone can look perfect on the outside, they can eat a perfect paleo ancestral diet, they uh, may be low carb or moderate carb, but they still may have underlying dysbiosis. There's still an epidemic going on, people still have migraines, they still have eczema, they still have brain fog, fatigue, and sometimes body fat issues. And these are caused by dysbiosis of infectious disease agents that go on our mucosa, our mucosa lining. And then we have some new infectious diseases, like in uh, a Asia, SARS, and Africa, Zika, and a we have HIV now. So what is exactly in our gut? Well, healthy guts and, and unhealthy guts share something. They, they share any, any realm um, of the five kingdoms on Earth can be in the gut, except for kind of plants or algae. So we have every kingdom in the gut, animal kingdom, protista, protozoa, bacteria, fungi, and if you look at the human microbiome, we have low, very low diversity in the vagina. And I call this the channel of life. And I just love being here in Boulder and meeting all my soul sisters and colleagues here because we can talk about anything. We talked yesterday, uh, Dr. Natasha Winters is out in Durango. We were talking about vagina jingles. You should go check out her website. <laughs> it's like hilarious. 
And then I was trying to encourage my new friend, my new soul best friend, uh, Deborah Lee, to make a vagina yogurt. Because <laughs> uh, she helps women, like within two weeks, their group B strep is gone. She works here in the uh, Boulder Birth Center, and I think that's just phenomenal. So where there's the least diversity, we have very special strains. And in America, the, a lot of these are extinct. And this is partly the reason why we have so many food allergies, so much autism, so much dysbiosis. And where we have the highest diversity is the gut. There's about almost a 1,000 species. <coughs> and we can look at these through different testing. They're all available. On my website, you can do a U-Biome. There's a 10% off. Or you can do functional testing with any of the practitioners that follow functional analysis. And the skin has quite a lot. And um, our ear, nose, throat, and mouth have quite a lot as well. So what, what this is is kind of like they're all open. They're all outside. So we're constantly spending energy to keep invaders out, right? So the way I think of our gut microbiome, the 100 trillion there, they're kind of like our iOS. Their DNA is actually 300 times more than ours. They're always talking, 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 and they're part of, they interface with our own brain and neurology, and they're part of our iOS. So if your iOS kind of goes on blinking and not, doesn't work too well, how, how's it going to feel, right? So what if you have a lot of pathogens and uh, problems in your gut mucosa? Well, that turns out it's kind of like disease. <coughs> and if your computer is kind of like mine, I have like 30 windows open <laughs> at a time. <laughs> um, something's going to crash at some point, right? If your iOS cannot handle all these invaders constantly coming in and the ma malware starts getting in, the viruses start getting in, you're, you're going to get in trouble. And that hard drive might crash, hopefully not permanently. So I uh, subscribe. You're, after today's talk, you'll know 98% more than most gut researchers. Um, I look at a lot of European studies because they don't have GMOs, they don't have glyphosate as much as us, and they don't have as many antibiotics up until only like the last 10 to 15 years. So there is a gut, there's gut guardians, and you can choose your favorite superhero. I like Deadpool <laughs> and Wolverine. And, and each one of these species, I call them the ABCs. In several studies that I'm going to go over, they're always present in a healthy gut microbiome. And then when we look at a disease microbiome, guess what? They're extinct. They're gone or really just living on the edge and really compromised. And I'm going to talk about the one with the four pluses because that's one of the, f one of the few that actually comes in a probiotic. I actually had to design it because there was nothing on the market that really worked. Um, and then <coughs> the second one, actually, there's two strains that come in a soil probiotic. Who's heard of prescript assist made by Environmentica? Yeah, they're awesome. So this combination, the B and B, is the best we actually have right now, uh, unless you're licking uh, dirt every day, which I do recommend. <laughs> and don't get too confused with the names, but there's A, B, B, and C and C. The Clostridialis is a larger group, and I talk a lot about these on my website, thegutinstitute.com. Uh, these are really awesome, and they lend uh, longevity to us. But they're not as important as the A's and the B's. And I'll tell you in, in just a second. And how do we feed these? Because uh, sometimes we're lost. You know, we don't know how to feed the little creatures in our zoo. They love eating all kinds of inulin-rich foods, and their f other favorite food is mucin. So we need to keep our outside mucosa, you know, the mucosa that actually is exposed to the outside, we need to keep it healthy. And what do you think lowers mucin, their favorite food? Stress, yeah, antibiotics, and then a slew of other things. CrossFit, okay, when you start pu puking, okay, you're stressing your gut out. Please don't do that. That's dysbiosis. And then any departure from, any departure from, oh, sorry, any departure from our ancestry is going to cause uh, problems. And yesterday, with my soul sisters, we were talking about, oh, it, we, uh, there was a wonderful talk by Amber O'Haran, and she was talking about pre-mastication. That's a form of not only prebiotic, the food, but also the probiotic from healthy mom and dad's mouth microbiome. I actually remember my dad chewing food up for me. And all these ways, are d ways we are disrupting the legacy that our mom gives us through the vaginal microbiome and the stool microbiome. You know, the first breath that a baby takes is actually loaded with bacteria. It's mom's microbiome from the vagina. And if you're lucky, you got a lick of her butt. <laughs> so you hope your mom has a badass butt, because then you will be set for life, and you'll have all the ABCs. And if you don't, I'll just tell you ways how you'll, you can rebuild it. So there's a recent study um, that um, uh, Jack Gilbert and his group um, did. Um, actually, we were both interviewed for a movie coming up soon. Um, it's made by the Microbooth microbirth producers, so I hope you get a chance to see it later. 
And they looked at where is the lowest rate of asthma and allergies on, uh, in the Western civilization. It's the Amish. They're um, of German descent, and they compared it with another group that are uh, almost genetically identical, the Hutterites, and they're also farmers um, in America. The Amish have very, very low levels of everything, autism, cancer, asthma. They were particularly looking at asthma. And what they found was there's a huge correlation between all the poop they're exposed to, <laughs> uh, basically, um, horses, cows, hay, sheds, barns, um, and they live very, very closely to the animals, whereas the Hutterites live very far away, miles away. They were not treading in all the barn dust or dirt and dust. And what they, when they analyzed dust in other studies, they found that dust is full of microbes. They're, they're probiotics. Um, you get bacilli, which is found in um, many good soil-based probiotics, including prescriptocyst, and bacteroides, which is really awesome at make, uh, breaking down complex carbohydrates. Another group which has very, very low allergies and very low Western diseases is Burkina Faso. Many of the hunter-gatherer groups who still live a traditional life have very low levels of conditions, chronic inflammatory conditions that we see. So you can see here they have huge exposures to what? Dirt. Dirt, dust, bacilli, bacteroides. And they do eat, most hunter-gatherers actually live very close to the equator and they eat a lot of grains. They ferment all their grains. Their diet is very high in something called bensalaga, and it's soured. This is how they, they don't refrigerate. They, this is how they preserve their food so it doesn't go bad after a day, an a few hours in the heat. And what you'll see here is they compare the Burkina Faso kids gut microbiome with uh, European, Italian um, microbiomes, and there's 20 times more Klebsiella. This is one of the bad guys, one of the Darth Vader's. <laughs> all my patients have it. <laughs> Um, I actually used to have it, um, and I didn't always look like this. I used to be a lot heavier, but when I got rid of Klebsiella and brought in a lot of good flora, I was able to get rid of a lot of conditions like chronic fatigue, body fat, and brain fog. So this makes a big difference because these are invading our iOS. Yeah, and you don't want your iOS to crap out on you, no pun intended. So all of these are proteobacteria, and you'll see a case I'll share later, the E. coli. This is the family of E. coli. It's really jacked up, and these kids, what were they eating? A whole bunch of junk, but they also probably got antibiotics. So their mucin was very low, and they also were on a low-fiber diet. So we really don't want the pathogens in the gut. They, they compete with our old friends, the guards, the guardians, the Deadpools, the Captain Americas, and they cause us disease. They drain our energy. They make our windows crash. Instead of opening 30, 40, 50 windows, you're going to only open 5 or 10 if you're lucky. And they come in the form of viruses. Um, parasites, Giardia, Blastocystis, E. coli is the biggest. It, it, it's so uh, like uh, algal bloom. After antibiotics, it just flares. And even some functional medicine herbal products can make them flare because they're so strong. So we have to be gentle, use very low doses, and always introduce really good flora at the same time. Another way to mess up your gut is take raw potato starch. Our gut doesn't like it. It's crap. And I actually gave credit to uh, a couple years ago because some of the animal data looked good, but when it looked turned to the human data, it's, it was really bad. And the reason is because it feeds all the pathogens that most people already have in the gut. And I saw people get fatter on it, they were getting crazy on it, and no one really seemed to have weight loss or clearance of their body fat. And the reason is because it feeds candida, yeast, clostridium, Klebsiella, and E. coli, which are the most common pathogens in the gut. Now let's see what a good gut looks like in another way. This is sort of uh, looking ge geographically. So the ileum is part of the small intestine. And so when you see, this is an IBD, an inflammatory bowel disease gut. So you have, you have gut dysbiosis as well as an autoimmune component. And you can see the yellow part is proteobacter, proteobacteria. Again, it's like a Darth Vader, and it's just massively here in the small intestines. And you may or may not pick it up on testing unless you do urine testing. Again, I'll show an example of that so you can kind of look at what it looks like. And you can have certain genetic types that make you more prone for IBD. Um, certain genetic types allows more E. coli to fester and take residence in the gut because the immune system may not recognize them and, and shoo them out. And you can see this healthy gut. There's a lot of Bs and Cs. And then there's, um, you can't see the acromantia, but there's a sliver of acromantia A, and there's a sliver of bifidobacter longum, which is in our probiotic. Um, so you can see this is a very balanced gut. And there's bacilli, which are probably very similar, you know, that are found in um, dirt. So, it, so who, who else has really good ABCs? 
there was a study done on an elite Irish rugby team. And they did super vigorous exercise, um, and then they checked their gut. The exercise was directly related to the diversity of the gut. They had 22 phyla, which are the different branches of uh, the gut microbiome, like diff you know, different categories of gut, uh, gut flora. And basically, the more exercise, the double the diversity. Because when they controlled the BMI in healthy controls, they had half, half the phyla. Who else has the ABCs? Supercentenarians. Do you want to be a supercentenarian? Um, I like to mimic what supercentenarians um, can achieve naturally. I don't know if it's diet or genetic factors or their environment. It's probably a com combination of everything. So supercentenarians are aged 105 to 115. And uh, Elena Biaggi and Illy, she's also looked at Chinese centenarians, and she finds the same thing. They're all enriched with acetate producers, Acromantia, Bifobacteria longum, and Christian Sinella. And the way to feed these is what I showed you earlier, inulin-enriched foods, keeping your mucin healthy, um, beans and bran, which have a lot of special oligosaccharides, they feed the ABCs, and we want them in our diet. So we uh, had to actually produce our own probiotic, formulate our own, because I wasn't getting a lot of good results. Um, I ran into Erica Holmes, one of our volunteers, and she's telling me she's been on a pro probiotic for over a month. Um, I hear this all the time. People have tried other things, high doses, really expensive probiotics, and, and this works. She said she had tried many things. Her sugar cravings went down. Her sleep improved dramatically. So many improvements in her digestion. Everything was really game-changing. And I hear this, like, all the time, all the time. And I think it's because people are missing the ABCs, especially bifidobacteria longum. And then yesterday, we had a wonderful talk from Megan Sanctuary at UC Davis, a PhD candidate working with um, necrotizing colitis and kids with autism. And we have... Um, the bacteria that she uses in her probiotic, Bifidobacterium, infant, Bifidobacterium infantis, um, which adults even have a little bit, but as we get older and we eat uh, more um, other foods, we get more longum. So what I see over and over is that people can even have die-off occasionally when they first take our probiotic because their pathogens start lowering in, in population. Um, our, pro our probiotic appears to degrade oxalates, so some people, even in paleo land, can't tolerate greens, shard, berries, sweet potatoes. These are high oxalate foods. Carob, chocolate, um, all the wonderful foods, right? So it's actually not you know, optimal to not tolerate some of these foods that Mother Nature has enrobed and protected with um, oxalates. They're actually the most nutritious foods on Earth. Um, and we can cook them, we can you know, ferment them, that can help. Um, but really, when we lose these strains because of antibiotics or stress, then we are not able to break down oxalates when we're, we're, whereas we should naturally, and we can bring them back in. Soil probiotics, many of them also, like Oxalobacter form formigenes, also breaks down oxalates. But we have a whole ecosystem, actually, of um, small intestinal bacteria that live right on the mucosa. They protect your IOS, and they can break down oxalates. They also can break down mycotoxins, gluten. Who doesn't want that? Um, and dairy, casein, and lactose. And in the end, when this improves and they uh, colonize, people notice uh, improved energy, less fatigue, less body fat, less brain fog. So I'm going to go over some of the ancient ap apothecary that I've had the pleasure of um, getting to know the last couple years. Um, one is our most ancient. It actually comes from uh, a combination of frankincense and myrrh. Um, and it's called Boswellia. Um, the Latin name is Boswellia. We commonly use serrata, but there's a couple other strains that are awesome. And they have very special chemical moieties in there that do everything except clean your window. <laughs> um, they're antiviral, they're anti-cancer, they're anti-fungal, they're um, anti-parasitic, uh, they, they lower the East African um, sleeping disease, they lower malaria. Um, I'll go over a couple things, but they lower biofilms. So the problem, I think, with a lot of pharmaceuticals that we have, they, they may take care of a ba bacteria, you know, temporarily, with, and will flare yeast and flare other life forms in the gut, but none probably address biofilms very well. It's very hard to address biofilms. And when we don't address biofilms, we get, we get stagnation. And as we know for exercise, if we're stagnated, our muscles don't feel well, right? If we don't use it, we lose it. So when we have stagnation in the lymph, um, that, that becomes difficult, and you're going to get a roadblock, and your IOS, will your IOS will probably start conking out. So one of the special things that about frankincense is the me mechanism of action is that it's kind of a broad-spectrum anti-inflammatory. It's anti-TNF, anti-NF-kappa-B, 
and specifically it's anti-5 LOX. LOX is kind of like um, Motrin and ibuprofen, but instead of damaging gut lining, it actually restores it. There actually are studies that show it's tissue regenerative because it's anti-inflammatory and it addresses root problems. So probably the wise men were right. <laughs> and um, even going back thousands of years BC, like 1500 or even earlier BC, um, there were, um, in the pyramids, they found uh, frankincense and myrrh oils and documentation that there's a, there's a pharmacopoeia, a, f a pharo, uh, pharo pharmacopoeia, and they use these medicinally. And some of the ancient uses was for everything. Um, irregular menses, dysmenorrhea, um, after pregnancy to break up clots and heal the uterus and make sure there's no stagnation from bleeding. Warriors also use frankincense and myrrh. Uh, it would help with internal as well as external wounds, you know, breaking up fibrin, uh, allowing new blood to flow through and better health. There's one study that showed it had anti-ulcer properties. They stressed the heck out of these little animals, um, gave them pyloric stricture, cold restraint. They gave them a bunch of NSAIDs like Indocin, a really strong NSAID like ibuprofen and aspirin. And um, it uh, was dose related, um, but they saw uh, improvement and prevention of uh, gastric ulcer uh, development. So it's actually been really well studied, even though we know the merit uh, ancestrally for uh, this herb. Um, they would actually have trees and tap it out like, uh, like uh, maple syrup. So anything that actually protects a tree from pathogens, pesticides, or pests, you know, they, they have actually properties that help them to stay, have good longevity, and it actually helps us. Plants actually can help us in that way when we use them um, with, with good consciousness. So there's been at least 47 Boswellia studies. This was published a few years ago in the uh, British Medical Journal. They did a systemic review. They found re four really good um, studies, RCTs with uh, good methodology. They found there was hardly any serious adverse effects. And when they compared them, they were um, for, diff for totally unrelated conditions, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, which is IBD, osteoarthritis, collagenous colitis, and chronic colitis. They found huge improvements. In fact, the three colitis studies, they put it against um, a drug, uh, one gram sulfasalazine three times a day, and it actually, uh, Boswellia, kind of a low moderate dose, um, induced remission in 70% of people compared to 40% on the drug. So I'm kind of a uh, altered you know, pharmacist <laughs> who does functional medicine now, and I have to say, I, I think uh, drugs can get trumped uh, by either bugs or our ancient apo apothecary. So you can find it um, in various, uh, a really high quality uh, supplement makers um, produce it and you can use 600 to 3,000 milligrams a day and it can be used even as a tea bark, that's the ancestral way uh, to use it uh, with hot water um, or it comes in a capsule or a tablet. I actually prefer some liquids because some people's guts are just so kind of riled up, they, they don't, I try to bypass the gut, so we use uh, uh, liquid extracts, and that works really well. So I talk a lot about biofilms because, um, do you guys know what a biofilm is? Do you ever leave a cup lying out for a few days and it gets, all, like your kids, and it gets all slimy, yucky? That's like our body. All the harmful bacteria, all the good and the bad bacteria in our, our body and yeast, they, they like making biofilms. It's their home. <laughs> and then a lot of things hide there. So. One of the benefits um, for them is that they have a protective fortress and it decreases our killing effects. We have antimicrobial peptides that are very selective to kill pathogens only, but it can't transcend into there. They can't make it in there, they're protected. Even our neutrophils will be impaired, can't make their uh, killing ROS, and so they stay hidden in there. And this is why a lot of people, when they see a functional medicine provider um, and they get treated, and I had this problem too, uh, you know, the second you lick a strawberry or you eat normal again, all your symptoms come back. It's, it's not a sustainable treatment because the root problem still has not been addressed. So what I see is that people have lots of staph, especially if, if they have ear, nose, throat issues, skin issues, and guess what? Buzzwelly helps to break those biofilms down. And also people have a lot of strep and strep biofilms. These are identified in studies, especially in the mouth microbiome, like strep, um, strep pyogenes. And one of the strongest uh, chemical moieties that come from Boswell is known as AKBA. 
and it will just crack the strep out and crack the strep biofilms. So the next herbal I'm going to talk, uh, botanical I'm going to talk about is, no, is myrrh, and it can be used both topically as well as internally. And what study shows that it has really broad antibacterial and antifungal activities in the oil and the resin, and they're just as good as modern um, medications. I really like them because they're gentle and they restore tissue. You know, we don't want to damage too much. And a lot of the other er botanicals I talk about, they're weeds. <laughs> this is how they've sustained being on Earth, and that's why they're so awesome. So myrrh comes from Kamifora. All of these that I, I'm going to talk about, Taraxacin, Dandelion, Artemisia, Wormwood, Scultaria, Skullcap, they all break, studies show they break down biofilms. And you, you don't, uh, if you guys want, don't, you don't need to take notes. I'm going to post the slides up later with citations and everything. All of them also have very specific anti, broad actually, but gentle, antiparasitic, antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial um, activity. I was talking with Jeffrey Miller the other night. Um, and you know he has he had his talk yesterday about how parasites may be manipulating our behavior. Well, it's totally true. Um, he he wasn't aware, but actually many of our bipolar and schizophrenic medications have antitoxoplasma activity. And so does artemisia, and, sh and so does a couple uh, couple mushrooms. And um, so if you know anyone crazy, you probably they should probably get tested <laughs> for antibodies against toxo. It's so common because it's found in in stools and dirt, and you know there's cross contamination. Um, so, um, Taraxacum is one of my favorite dandelion. You don't need a lot. It's so gentle. Um, I love to go running and I'll kind of taste dandelion on my run and hopefully I don't get too much dog pee. <laughs> um, but Taraxacum was shown in a clinical, uh, in an in vitro study. Um, it grows bifidobacterium and back lactobacilli. These are part of our ABCs, our gut guardians. Um, it has, it has inulin too. And it's used for many, many things. Like it's shown even to reduce ages, AGES and glucose. It raises uh, HDLs. Artemisia is really a star. I love Artemisia. It's also known as wormwood. And it, it has so much activity against liver flukes, schistosoma, toxo, CMV, a lot of viral activity. And have you guys heard of Skullcap? Yeah, Skullcap has anti-toxo activity too. And a lot of people feel calm on it. And I always wonder, oh, Maybe Trump needs some, and who knows what's in his gut. I don't really want to know. <laughs> but um, it's fantastic, and they had a study where it was paired with curcumin for sick uh, chickens. They were all infested, they infested them actually with salmonella proactively. And they found um, this combination, curcumin skullcap, raised one of the ABCs, the fecalibacterium, as well as good lactobacilli. And then they saw strep uh, go way, way down. Or salmonella, sorry, they saw salmonella go down. So I'm going to go over a case. Um, I call him Mr. High-Powered Executive. Um, he came to me um, in uh, February. He um, had already gone paleo for four months, still was not seeing all the improvements he wanted. He had heart disease, three-vessel coronary artery calcification. He's ApoE4, high homocysteine. He also complained of having ED. Um, he had four kids, so it didn't really matter, but he had e a mild ED, no morning erections um, at all. And after working together for about only two or three months, 80% resurrection. Okay. <laughs> And so here are labs for all you guys to geek out. So he had calcified arteries, calcified liver, calcified who knows what else. There's a huge family history of high oxalates. He had high oxalates, you'll see in a second. His grandpa and uncle in their very early 30s had kidney stones. He's really into testing. He saw a small dense LDL um, go down by half with our treatments. Um, and he didn't change anything. He didn't change diet or exercise much. I did try to encourage him to do more exercise because as you know from the APOE4 talks yesterday, very important to do chronic cardio. Um, and get the heart rate up. Um, and you can see his mar other markers got so much better. So I do a lot of nutrigenomics with people because it's the only way that we can quickly fix the gut and improve longevity. You know, look at adrenals and why they're, uh, you know, kind of pooped out. Uh, a lot of my athletes, they tell me, oh, I feel fine. Then I pull their labs and like, holy, you know, holy dandelion, you know, everything's triple depleted and tanked. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, so Mr. Executive, he had a lot of things tagged. He was triple depleted on neurotransmitters from the adrenal gland, so we had to boost his adrenals. The body has to be catabolic in order to heal. You know, if you're in an anabolic state, high cortisol, you're, you're never going to heal the gut or any other organ that you're trying to, or, uh, to um, fix. And I was trying to fix a couple organs. So we improved his um, adrenal function, and it, we, we didn't do the testing yet, but I know his testosterone is going to be off the chart. Usually when I work with men and women, uh, their hormones improve so dramatically in only a month. Men become testosterone warriors, the tes free testosterone goes up over 30%, women, their progesterone goes up 
and they're no longer infertile. So he had FUT2, so kind of like MTHFR, the uh, mother, you know, one. Uh, the FUT2 designates how much fiber we have on our mucosa. So if you're kind of screwed, you know, triple homozygous is kind of screwed. I have one homozygous. And um, this will allow more E. coli and pathogens and yeast to overgrow. And that causes more crashing of the hard drive. Again, I don't really care so much all the variations and mutations. If they're expressing, they're a big deal. But if you're healthy, there's low oxidative stress, they, they won't be expressing. That's what studies show. There's hypomethylation of the CPG islands. It's not a big deal. But when they are expressing, you really need to pay attention, and we have to bypass these. And everyone's different, so therapy really needs to be customized so that you can bypass things faster and lower inflammation. Because inflammation is th in the gut is what allows a lot of these pathogens to grow, and then it prevents our ABCs, our gut guardians, from growing. So he had ApoE4, ApoE2. So he's kind of partly agrarian, partly <laughs> Northern, Northern European warrior Viking. Um, he had a couple SNPs for sulfur. CBS is kind of jacked. So I took him off a lot of sulfur as much as we could. Um, we took off a couple supplements, and we lowered his, his methylfolates. When, when you have this combination of um, different mutations, it's best to get methyls from other places, not methylfolate. Um, so we took off some of the high dose methylfolates he was on. He felt he couldn't tell really a lot of differences, but again, you know, he's a high powered executive <laughs> and trucks on. But his glutathione, you saw the GST, he had several mutations for glutathione production. His body just does not make as much glutathione when he eats cauliflower and broccoli like everybody else. So he's going to supplement until the stress goes down, and then I'm sure he'll be able to produce it on his own. So we use a little touch of Boswellia. Most of the clients I have, when they have huge inflammation, like iron overload, joint pain, uh, one, one client, she was going to go get her hip surgery. She started Boswellia and completely canceled it, started running around everywhere. Boswellia is really amazing. Um, so I'm sure this had something to do with how his, his gut got better and improved malabsorption. And then he took our probiotic, 200 billion a day, and we did one phase. I work with people in phases. So the first phase, we do a little bit of wheat, gentle weeding, seeding, seeding, and then we keep working. And then by the end, we're feeding. We're bringing up and resurrecting a lot of strains that are missing and gone. So I use something called SF722. It comes from castor oil. A lot of places in Africa, they still use and ferment castor oil beans. They process them because it can be toxic, but they process it, and it's a natural part of their diet. But it's actually very, very antifungal, and it's very gentle, so I love it. And then we use um, a low dose of something with Artemisia called GI Microbe X, and that was uh, partly how his gut um, really improved. So you can see this is the initial test. We're going to repeat it, but we don't have it yet. Seven out of 12 markers for fungus, fungi, were all elevated. His oxalates, which come from Aspergillus and Candida and other yeasts, were very high. When you see oxalates, you always think fungal overgrowth, too many antibiotics, too many IV antibiotics, too much stress, and then these fungal markers. And they always go down in, a m in just one phase or two phase. So he also did a stool test from Genova, and you can see everything's overgrowing. So for this gentleman, we didn't use any um, fiber. And then after treatment with just one phase, we um, unfortunately knocked out this, but they're probably going to be working better. But we knocked out Clostridium. And a little bit of the fusobacterium went down. This is highly associated with colitis, colorectal cancer, a lot of different cancers, cavities, periodontal disease. So because he had so much grow we were growing, in the beginning we didn't use actually much fiber. We are going to add it in later. So no fiber for him, <laughs> except from <laughs> diet. <laughs> and I was very pleased he was able to resurrect lactobacilli, okay? And he was able to knock out some of the strep. So the strep went way, way down. And you can see here, E. coli is really my bugger. It's always showing up. So after the second or third phases, they usually go down. It takes a little more deeper treatment. So I'd love to entertain any questions now, and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the microphone. We have approximately five minutes for questions, and Grace is going to be available afterwards uh, to follow up with in the back as well. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. I just wanted some clarification. Uh, the skull cap, was that uh, Chinese or? Um, I think it's used around the world. Well, there's an American. I think they're different. There's, there are some different versions. Some, sometimes the uh, botanicals will have some chemical moieties like 
tryptotoys, I can't pronounce all of them, or tannins or some, uh, something. Uh, the Asian one is the bicalinus uh, that where a lot of the studies were used, but they use okay. a c there's other studies that show similar benefits okay, or similar thank you. spectrum. And then uh, was it the anabolic state is where you want to be in? I mean, no one has to be Schwarzenegger. I'm just saying it's best if there's a spectrum like a, a pendulum. Um, it's best not to be in a totally catabolic state right. every day, okay. 24 seven. Thank you. Yeah, thank um, you. and yeah, thanks. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, Thank you. I'm wondering what you think of the Young Living essential oils. They have frankincense. They're wonderful. Yeah, I um, would be careful using anything orally too high of a dose. Um, you know, because they're super potent. Like I stopped totally using high dose berberine and oregano oil and many of the things that I used to use, like high dose rosemary, because many of these you can't even put on your skin. So can you imagine how caustic and damaging it might be to you know compromise gut mucosa? Oh yeah. There's some w really wonderful protocols for living, living ill. Okay, and would you use capsules with oil in them, like a carrier oil? Would I'm not really through? familiar with those protocols, uh, okay. but I've heard of really good results if, if people are careful and not using high doses. Okay, and do you work with people remotely? Yes, I have a practice. You can contact me through my website. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Good morning, great talk, thank you. Um, what causes biofilms to form, and are there things you can do to keep them from forming in the future in your body? They form because we stress them out. We make, we make um, an environment hostile. Yeah, so that can come in any form, right? Even, even negative bad thoughts, because um, you're um, raising adrenaline and cortisol. And most pathogens, they have something called a virulence island, and they have receptors for adrenaline and cortisol. So the second we're stressed out, they're like, party! Uh, whereas our good flora, all the ABCs, they don't have these virulence islands. And they're more fragile. You have to really kind of nurture them. And, you know, like a garden, if you want lots of tomatoes, zucchini, and, um, you know, lots of fruit and produce, you have to nurture those. They're a little more delicate than the dandelion that just pops out everywhere, right? But we don't want to get rid of all our dandelions. They're wonderful. It's just this harmony, this balance that we want to get. So I kind of work with people over three phases. It may start off 1090, like 10 only, 10 percent only good stuff. You know, acromantia, bifolongum, and all the other good ones, rosburia, and 90% crap. <laughs> and then we gradually shift. And you don't want to do, do too radically or fast either, because people will have die off. You know, some of these bad pathogens, they're just loaded all up our mucosa. And, you know, if you knock them out too fast, people feel really ill and they, they get more inflamed, and, and you, you want to kind of buffer that. So we do more of the killing after some buffering, you know, getting on some antioxidants, getting on the glutathione if appropriate, um, and uh, other really good things. Thank you. Thanks. Great talk. Um, where would you recommend finding, um, for lack of a better term, I guess, the best dirt in the world <laughs> or around yeah, in your local area? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know. And is that <laughs> Is there any left? <laughs> <laughs> Not America. <laughs> <laughs> would that be preferable to Not probiotics? Not Iowa. <laughs> I don't know. Europe. I'd go to Europe. Really? I love Germany. I love uh, Netherlands and Sweden. <laughs> I don't think they use GMO there. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, would you prefer that over most probiotics? Um, you know, it's really wonderful. If you um, have your own garden, you can get any of the academic, ac academic centers to do dirt testing, soil testing for you. And you mm -hmm. could see if there's any, like, missing minerals or too many um, glyphosate and do some remediation. Right. Yeah, I think it's best if you have yeah. your own garden. Or share a co-op, a CSA, and get your hands in the dirt, v volunteer at a farm. Those are awesome ways. Right. And uh, last, are, are you introducing everything orally or anything through enemas? or? Yeah, otherwise? so actually some people do use our probiotic e through an enema, and um, they have fantastic results. Um, sometimes there's die-off, though, because it's very potent. Um, but um, uh, mouth, like if you hold it a little bit, it may enter the lymph. You know, like our boobies and our breast milk is not sterile. It comes, like, it carries both fiber and um, bacteria from our gut. So uh, we have lymph, and um, if you hold the probiotic a little bit in your mouth, you probably help irrigate some of the good, you know, bring in good bacteria into your lymph. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so this is great for treating people with, obviously, that need, like, some, like, good gut healing stuff going on. So I'm just curious, what about on, once you get somebody into, like, a really good place, what's, like, a good maintenance plan for them? using some of these oils, like would you, and also- Well, we have to be careful with the oils. They can kill, but you know, they are used ancestrally occasionally for little chronic things. Um, 
So yeah, I think if they're appropriately studied and, and used you know, at the right time, that's awesome. And then for maintenance, I really think people can do a, a really good maintenance program with fiber, like 30 to 40, 50 grams of fiber. Ancestrally, we probably had 100, 120, 150 grams, but that's still something. Mm -hmm. And then a, a good f uh, probiotic regimen or being in the garden, um, mm -hmm. either one would be great. Yeah, and I was specifically curious about biofilms because the reality is, is that as much as we can control stress in our life, it's still gonna happen. Yeah. So is there something okay. that you would recommend as like an annual like kind of cleanse for biofilms at all? Um, I'm not really familiar with that. I, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean some people tell me they feel awesome. Um, I, I don't know I don't know what the studies say either. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And this will be the last question, but thanks so much. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about um, dirt as a disease vector. Uh, I know that for one, uh, if you expose yourself to dirt containing uh, black blastomycosis fungi, it yeah. can actually uh, totally eat your bones. Oh yeah, right? yeah. Or if you're uh, in a moldy home, if you breathe it in, you're going to get the mold spores into your lungs, which will then go to your lymph. Yeah. So, yeah. so have you investigated uh, dirt as a disease vector and not just as a? Uh, um, I think if someone's moderately healthy and they're they're not immunocompromised. Um, actually, some of my clients, a lot of them are immunocompromised, and I recommend they eat everything cooked not even raw salad in the beginning, because you can pick up anything from even a five-star you know, salad, a five-star restaurant and a salad. But you bring up really good points. Uh, it's, if we have a healthy garden, there's much less mold, right? You have good flora, good soil, like ecosystems that take care of mold, and you wouldn't deal with that problem as much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.